everyone, Liz Collin here. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Liz Collin Reports, a place for truth and meaningful Minnesota conversations. On the podcast today, we are digging into an article from Thinking Minnesota Magazine. It's the quarterly magazine published by the Center of the American Experiment that's hitting mailboxes soon. The headline, Doubling Down on CRT, the Radical Ethnic Studies Edition to Minnesota's Proposed Social Studies Standards, encourages students to disrupt and dismantle America's fundamental institutions. Some of the proposal has been made public before in small bits and pieces. A senior policy fellow at the center discovered some of it has not, and it's an eye-opener. Catherine Kirsten joins me to talk about what she found. Catherine, thank you for being here and for all the work that you've done bringing this to light. Well, thanks. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you, Liz, and it's, uh, it's a crucially important topic. And, and you write that, Catherine, how did Minnesota schools get hijacked in service of this extremist agenda? To answer, we must examine who drafted the standards, investigate their links to like-minded groups, and connect the dots. And to your credit, that's what you did. And this has been a, a lot of work, you can tell, that, that went into this article. But let's just start there with ethnic studies, some background. Describe what that is how it's basically a part of the social studies standards review currently underway in Minnesota. Right. Well, the the law in Minnesota sets out four subject matters as part of social studies, and they are history, civics, geography, and economics. There are four of these. Uh, the the uh, Governor Waltz's uh, social studies standards revision committee, though, has added a fifth strand, they're calling it, so-called ethnic studies, which again is not authorized in law. And ethnic studies uh, really is the umbrella ideology that critical race theory springs from. But it goes beyond CRT with its kind of anti-racist focus. It instructs students to disrupt, dismantle, and transform America's fundamental institutions. It it teaches them, in fact, this is the title of one of the standards, to resist, resist uh, basically uh, America's fundamental institutions. It enlists them as ideological foot soldiers in this extremist uh, activist woke campaign. And the social studies standards is adopted in 2004 by the legislature it kind of authorizes uh, MDE, the Minnesota Department of Education, to revise these standards every 10 years. Correct. Yeah. And and so when the process began in 2004, and I, I observed it, uh, it was a meticulous process that involved the legislature. It was all very transparent. Uh, 2011, when you know the, the revision took place under the date administration, things got watered down, but it was basically the same process. It was radically different this time. Now, the law requires, in terms of academic standards, that our standards must be rigorous, academically focused, that they're supposed to prepare kids for college and career, that the standards be objective and measurable and consistent with the U.S. and Minnesota constitutions. That is not what we have right now. And the major reason is that when MDE put together the committee that was charged with revising the standards, it excluded academic content matter experts and it stacked the committee with uh, political activists and ideological zealots who have just a deep animus against America and everything our nation uh, uh, is, you know, is, is founded on. And I know you've been following this story for, for more than a year, but the the story here kind of begins in July 2020, and and you're talking about this this decision by MDE to pick this group of leaders for the what's called the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Coalition. But but yeah, give us some background and and you know the goal I guess behind that that group. Yes. Okay. Um, and again, n- nobody knows this. It was it was only by going online and digging through the websites of these groups I'm going to speak about, uh, you know, connecting the dots among these groups that I I discovered this. But the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Coalition is a group of 15 advocacy groups, uh, and uh, one of the leaders has said that uh, he believes uh, Minnesota's public education system is a quote 
white supremacist puzzle that must be taken apart and exposed for the lie that it is. So that is basically a view of our public education that a system that's shared by the, the members of this, or the organizations that are members of the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Coalition. And so before we go go too much into the, the coalition, just, just to back up here, because you make this point, you actually call it scandalous, but you say that MDE actually decides to cut out subject matter experts in this process. Yeah, um, well, the only person of uh, the only um, university level, uh, you know, trained academic quote, expert on the committee was a woman from the University of Minnesota who is a historian who focuses on um, African slave religions, in particular, Obeya or voodoo. Uh, there is nobody uh, on the committee, no expert focusing on the American founding, on 20th century history, etc. You get the idea. The leaders were drawn from these extremist activist groups with uh, an ideological political agenda of transforming our nation. And you talked about one of the, one of those quotes, which I had to read a few times just to make sure I was getting that correctly, but that's uh, someone from this education for liberation, Minnesota, that, that group. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, the, the, the uh, public education system being a white supremacist puzzle, et cetera. But some of the groups who were represented on the standards drafting committee, along with, by the way, on the first uh, committee of the, the, that drafted the initial standard, it's a smaller committee now, but initially it was 44, nearly 20% of those people were Native Americans. Native Americans make up a little more than 1% of the population in Minnesota. This was, you know, 18% uh, who represented uh, tribes and activist Indian groups. But another one of these groups that was sitting on the committee was uh, Navigate Minnesota. And they described themselves as a, quote, intersectional women, queer, Latinx-led organization committed to social justice. So that's the kind of ideological uh, uh, background of the groups making these decisions. And this same Ed Lib Minnesota group th that we mentioned, another quote here, it maintains that schools, quote, must view students through the lens of skin color. It claims that black students who misbehave in schools are consciously or unconsciously resisting racist educational contexts and so must be seen not as behavior problems, but as barometers who measure the toxic atmosphere of a deep history of anti-black and white supremacist logics. Yes. So so um, first we talked about the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Coalition, uh, whose leaders of, of which were uh, on the social studies uh, drafting committee. Then we're, we're talking now about education for liberation in Minnesota. And that is because the Minnesota Ethnic Studies Coalition was uh, created in 2019 by Education Liberation Minnesota in order to basically hijack our social studies uh, revision process. And this is all on their on their website. But what one thing that's helpful to keep in mind about Ed Lib Minnesota, this kind of group back there that sort of engineering this, is that this is a group that uh, seeks to abolish the police. I mean, abolish police, not just defund. Abolish police, our prison systems, and our um, border controls. Let's talk more about these proposed lesson plans, uh, because I think that's quite interesting and something parents should know too. But you point out one is called resistance. Talk about that though. What are these students doing in this lesson? I know you gave an example of what fifth graders <laughs> would, would learn under this lesson plan. Yes, yes. So um, <clears throat> there are three ethnic studies uh, standards. Uh, one of them is entitled resistance. And uh, what, what I've, one thing I focused on in the article was uh, how this will play out in terms of instruction in the classroom on um, the police and the, the criminal justice system. So uh, in, in fifth grade, uh, students uh, will, quote, examine contemporary policing and its alleged, I, alleged is my word, and its historical roots in early America. What does that mean? 
Well, when you dig farther and look at who's behind us, it means that they're going to be teaching our kids that um, our police today sprang directly from slave patrols uh, of the Old South. So that's fifth graders. Sixth graders will study the impact of Minnesota's juvenile justice system, uh, especially on youth from historically disenfranchised groups. And then in high school, they'll build on this actually questioning the very notion of criminality. The idea is that even the, that the idea of criminality is itself a racist idea. So kids are supposed to, quote, explore how criminality is constructed and what makes a person a criminal. So kids are going to conclude most likely that uh, the very idea of criminality is racially constructed and is among the many things that schools are telling them they need to, quote, resist. So at this point, is anyone raising any red flags? I mean, we're pretty far along in the process at this well, point, Catherine. Uh, the, I know the Minnesota legislature rejects a proposal to put ethnic studies in state standards. That was last year. Correct. But it, it, this hasn't slowed down. No, and, and the big problem here, um, well, many big problems, but one of them is that back when uh, the Minnesota legislature decided that we should have statewide academic standards, it, it had legislative involvement, required legislative approval, the first time around only. That happened in 2004. From then on, every 10 years or so, the idea was they were going to trust the Minnesota Department of Education uh, to revise the standards on their own. So right now, the legislature has no power at all over uh, what is, is, will happen going forward. I mean, it would if the legislature, both houses, would, would vote to, you know, to stop this this uh, this progress and uh, and Governor Waltz would sign the bill, but of course that's not going to happen. So right now the legislature you know is taking no role in this. There's also this follow the money piece that you point to, which is quite telling. What did you find when it comes to that to that subject? Well, what you find is that the people who are promoting. Uh, these radical changes to our, uh, to, to the way that history and, and uh, geography and civics are taught uh, are often uh, the, the very people who, who uh, present themselves uh, as consultants, you know, high dollar consultants who, whose uh, help is necessary to implement all of this in your children's classroom because these standards, if they actually you know are implemented, uh, it's very likely that our entire, in every grade, social studies um, framework and lesson plans in all our schools will have to be completely redone. Where does the curricula come from? Where do the experts, the consultants who teach teachers how to implement all this new stuff come from? Well, they come from, in many cases, some of the same groups who are pushing for these changes in the first place. And in the article, I talk about what's happened in California, where something similar is going on. And there you see people involved initially in getting ethnic studies uh, into classrooms in California, now creating consulting groups. Uh, where consulting groups where they're charging $1,500 an hour, right? <laughs> one of them has charged, yep, $1,500 an hour to to help uh, your kids learn uh, that, the, that the police should be abolished. Wow. Let's fast forward now to this year's legislative session. Governor Walls made headlines proposing this due north plan, basically that would mandate ethnic studies. Well, yeah, his what he what he uh, called for in his uh, policy bill, which I understand now has been rolled into the the omnibus bill, is 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 going forward in that respect. What he called for is not only uh, the social studies standards, um, including ethnic studies, but uh, he wants to see ethnic studies in every academic subject and in every grade K through 12. And he even wants to mandate it in private schools and home schools. And we see it say in, in the math standards, the math standards are right behind the um, social studies standards. 
And those anchor standards were just released, the, the proposed math anchor standards. There are 11 and seven of them include uh, that, that, that math has to be linked with uh, the Dakota and Anishinaabe Indian tribes in seven out of the 11 uh, math standards. So, you know, number sense and proportionality and patterns and that kind of thing. Before MDE can formally adopt these proposed social studies standards, a hearing has to take place. So you describe that in, in your article in front of this administrative law judge. What do you expect to, to happen there? Because there is a lot of legality involved w- with this, and it seems like some missteps along the way. Yeah, exactly. So um, the, the administrative law judge uh, will review these standards after MDE uh, finishes what, what it calls its statement on need and reasonableness. I mean, their pitch for why, why all these changes should take place. But the administrative law judge won't say, you know, these are great standards or these are terrible standards in terms of content. Um, he or she will only say uh, that that uh, procedure laid out in law has been followed in terms of the rulemaking process. Now, uh, Center of the American Experiment will be vigorously um, uh, making the case that that these standards, as they're written, um, uh, fail the test on a, on a host of fronts. I mean, they're supposed to be uh, objective and measurable, which is absolutely not the case in, in so many instances. They're supposed to be consistent with the U.S. and Minnesota constitutions. Uh, no, they are not. Um, the, the procedure that was followed uh, was not statutorily uh, correct. For example, business people were supposed to be represented by law on the standards drafting committee, and there weren't any business people, at least uh, that we can determine. So we'll be making strong arguments, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's what we need is outpouring of concern on the part of the business community and nonprofits and and the media, civic organizations parents, uh, school boards, teachers saying, no, not on our watch. This isn't happening. And do you get the sense, Catherine, that parents fully grasp these changes or or, or know this is even happening? No, I I mean, no. (laughs) I I think that we've we've talked with a, a number of insiders who tell us, say, that teachers who are following this are increasingly concerned. We saw that uh, the Pioneer Press had a piece just recently saying that the reaction to this initial draft of the mass standards was, quote, overwhelmingly negative on the part of teachers and and parents. But here with the social studies standards, I, I just don't believe, despite all the work we've done at the center, we have we generated 80 percent of the of the public comments against this. Uh, you know, in in past months, but I think that the number of parents who really understand the the sea change that's you know going on here is, is still is not hasn't reached a critical mass. What specifically can parents do? Well, uh, I think parents need to uh, at this point um, uh, get in touch with their legislators. Get in touch with you know the Department of Ed uh, directly. Get in touch with uh, their school boards. Alert uh, their their friends, uh, their their children's uh, classmates, parents. There there needs to be a kind of a grassroots uh, tidal wave, uh, and, and it'll be focused uh, on the the hearing, which will take place. It's hard to say exactly when, but it it will be in a number of months. Uh, but there, there are public hearings. People can turn out, or can turn out for the public hearing, show up and uh, register their their deep concern, and let their legislators know that if you know if they're bold enough, they can step in even at this point. You know, I think a really interesting point is that all of this is happening at a time when our kids' academic performance is in free fall. So here's an unbelievable little number. Uh, there was just a, uh, I was just sent yesterday uh, something from the St. Paul Public Schools. It was an email that went out to parents 
uh, announcing that um, they they now on their own, uh, this isn't led to social studies standards, uh, have mandated an ethnic studies course for uh, all 10th graders. It'll start in the, the 2025 uh, school year. And th this email is asking parents for ideas, you know, what should be in, in the ethnic studies course that we teach. And if you if you take a look at the um, at, at the math proficiency of students in the St. Paul Public Schools class, it'll be the first to take this ethnic studies course. It's 16 percent. Right now, white students across Minnesota's reading uh, proficiency is 59 percent. Black students is 30 percent. Uh, Hispanic students is about the same. Math, 20% proficiency among Hispanics, 17% among Black students. Our kids are, are failing uh, at you know, fundamental academic skills. And, but yet they uh, want to shift the focus to this. But they want to shift the focus. Other. Exactly. So I know, Catherine, this will be a subject you will continue to, to follow at the center. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for joining us, Catherine Kirsten, a senior policy fellow at the Center of the American Experiment. And again, thank you for bringing this to light. It's a pleasure to be with you, Liz. Thanks. That will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We'll be back soon to keep meaningful Minnesota conversations going. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, or any other podcast platform. To stay up to date on all things Alpha News, sign up for our free daily newsletter on our website. It's one daily email where you'll see our stories, listen to our podcasts, and view our videos all right there. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time.